So we're talking about chi-square statistics in this video. Uh, this is a topic that's very uh, broadly applicable to lots of different tests. We're going to be talking about it in the context of heredity and inheritance problems. Um, but it's, it's a statistic that you could use in many um, different contexts. Uh, what is the purpose of a chi-square statistic? We're trying to um, compare what we actually get in a data set um, with results uh, that we can predict in advance. Um, so maybe we have some sense of how the data should come out according to a predictive model, and we just want to see are we close enough with our data to support um, uh, our model. So um, let's say you flip a coin and you think that it's going to be 50-50 in the results, but you get six heads, four tails. Um, what this statistical test will tell you is, is that close enough to support your prediction? So um, like all statistics, we want to set up a null hypothesis first. Um, the null hypothesis is typically f uh, formatted the same way from statistic to statistic. It's typically going to predict no significant difference between some sets of data. Um, in this particular case, we're going to set up a null that predicts no significant difference between our actual observed data and what we predicted it would come out as. And so in this case, we're actually trying to support the null hypothesis. Um, in other uh, d statistics that we practiced, like the t-test, we were actually trying to reject the null hypothesis. Um, but in this case, we're actually trying to support it and therefore support our predictive model. So let's do some examples. Um, what if we were to do a mono-hybrid cross like Mendel did? Remember that that means that we're just testing one trait and we're testing two heterozygotes to see uh, what comes out in the next generation. So if we build our square and we have two heterozygotes and we show um, the predicted results is what our Punnett square shows us, then we predict that three of the four of these um, p potential outcomes could be uh, dominant in phenotype. These three uh, show the dominant phenotype, whereas this um, possibility shows the recessive phenotype. So we predict a rough ratio of 3 to 1 in our next generation, or 75%, 3 fourths, dominant in phenotype, and 1 fourth, 25%, recessive in phenotype. So um, what if we actually did that cross, say, with flies um, in a simple Mendelian trait? Um, and let's say that that student gets 80 flies in the next generation who are dominant in phenotype and 30 who are recessive in phenotype. That isn't a 3 to 1 ratio, that's a 2.67 to 1 ratio. So again, you could ask the question, well, is that close enough? So um, we need to set up a null hypothesis. Um, we would predict here perhaps no significant difference between the actual observed results and the 3 to 1 expectation. So is that supported or not? Well, our chi-square statistic has the following formula. This formula is given on your equation sheet, and I'll show you that in just a minute. Um, and basically what this formula is, is calculating is the overall amount of difference between what you observed, or your actual data set, and what you expected to get according to prediction. So O minus E, we're going to see the difference between those numbers. We square it because we don't uh, care if the, if the actual results are less or greater than um, the expected results. We just want to see the difference. So we square it so that it isn't negative. We make it a fraction of what we expect. And then that sigma sign um, just tells us to add up all of the differences for all of the data points. So um, let's go through an example, and this will perhaps make sense. Um, if we observed 80 dominant and 30 recessive, then we need to figure out what we might have gotten had it matched the expected 3 to 1 ratio. So how can we do that? Well, we can simply add up the total number of flies. We know that there are 110 total flies. We know that maybe 75% of them should have been dominant. So what's 75% of 110? Um, I get 82.5. Um, and so some students ask sometimes whether it's uh, good to round. Um, you can either round this or not, um, depending on what kind of result you get. If I just get one decimal, like a half here, I'd be tempted just to leave it as is. Um, but if you're ever asked to calculate this on the AP test, um, they'll provide a range of acceptable answers to where you should be fine even if you do round somewhere. So let's go ahead and then look at... Oh dear, my pen just gave away. Um, so if we were also to do uh, 0 0.25, 
um, times 110. I'm now doing this with a mouse, so you'll have to excuse me. Um, the uh, results come out as 27.5. So those are our expectations, right? Um, 82.5 of the flies should have been dominant. 27.5 should have been recessive. So um, how can we then plug that into the formula? So we just want to, um, for each data point, the 80 flies and the 30 flies, we want to figure out how different that was from expectation. So if we do 80 minus 82.5, square that and then make it a fraction of what we expected, 82.5. And we want to do that for the other data point as well. So let's add that to, um, let's consider our 30 data point and how that should have been different from 27.5 prediction. Let's square that and let's make it a fraction of what we expected. Again, apologies for the uh, poor uh, quality of my penmanship with a mouse. So that's basically the formula. Take all your data points, subtract it from expectation, and add them together. And then that is the total amount of difference between your actual results and your expectations. Um, when I calculate that out, I got a total chi-squared of 0 0.30 or so. Hopefully, if you calculate that, you get a similar number. Um, sometimes students are confused by the squared. Um, they think, do I need to square root both sides to just get chi? Um, the number that we're interested in is chi squared. So you're sort of uh, finished with your calculation at that point. All right, and then we need to ask the question, um, what does that number mean? So we are interested in comparing that chi squared number that we just calculated to something called the critical value. And what the critical value simply does is it tells us this is the maximum amount of difference that's acceptable to still support your model or your, your null hypothesis. So um, is 0 0.30 too big? We need to find the appropriate critical value and see if it's smaller than that. If it is, then our model is supported. Our null hypothesis is supported. Uh, but if it's greater than the critical value, then there's just too much difference to be explained by random chance alone. We're going to have to reject our null hypothesis, reject our model, or at least reconsider what might have gone on to create the data set that we got. So let's do that. Um, this is taken straight from the equation sheet provided by the College Board for your AP test. You'll notice here that they've given you the equation for chi-squared in its calculation, so you don't have to memorize it. Um, they tell you what all of the um, uh, variables mean over here. Um, and then they give you the appropriate table. These are all critical values down here. So in order to calculate, uh, or excuse me, in order to find the critical value, we need to find the appropriate p-value to test and the appropriate degrees of freedom in the columns. Um, degrees of freedom simply is how many possibilities, how many phenotypes in this case were there in the experiment, and then subtract one. So we're assuming that it had to have, each data point had to have come out a certain way. Let's say that the fly could have just been dominant. Um, so how many other ways could it have come out? Um, the fly could have also been recessive. So in this case, there's one degree of freedom, two minus one equals one degree of freedom. Then we also need our p-value. Um, in this course, I've always seen a p-value of 0 0.05 used, so I assume that we're always going to use the top row. Um, but what is the p-value roughly? It's the idea that assuming the null hypothesis is true, uh, what are the odds that we could have gotten this data set simply due to random chance? Uh, we want to minimize that p-value as much as possible because I don't want random chance to have caused me to get the data I got. I'm hoping that I got the data that I got because my model predicted it. So we want to minimize the p-value, but generally we're going to use the top row. So if we go back and we use the top row, p of 0 0.05, 1 degree of freedom, then for this experiment, the critical value of 3.84 is the appropriate... Um, critical value to use. So because our original chi-squared number of 0 0.30 is less than our critical value of 3.84, uh, we can say that the null hypothesis was supported. We were close enough to what we expected to get. Okay. So let's do a second example that's perhaps a little bit more technical and complicated. What if we crossed a doubly heterozygous fly, so now we're doing a two-trait analysis, with a doubly homozygous recessive fly? 
I went ahead and give you traits here. Brown is dominant over the yellow yellow body, which is recessive. Red eyes are dominant over recessive white eyes. So um, we're doing a two-trait cross. We said that one of them is doubly heterozygous and one of them is doubly homozygous recessive. We practiced this in my earlier two-trait Punnett square video. Um, so we know that this parent can make four different gametes and this parent can make just one. So we expect to get these results in the cross. And what we really expect to get then is, is the famous one to one to one to one phenotype ratio. One of them should uh, show um, brown body and red eyes. Uh, one fourth of the flies should show brown body but white eyes. One fourth of them should show yellow body and red eyes. And one fourth of them should show both recessive phenotypes, brown body and white, uh, excuse me, yellow body and white eyes. So um, if the two genes are on separate chromosome pairs and we do this cross, then Mendel would predict we'd get these results. So what if we actually do that cross and we get results that look like this? Uh, brown body, red eyes, a lot of them, but very few with brown body and white eyes. Very few with yellow body and red eyes, and a lot with yellow and white eyes. It's almost as if um, the dominant alleles were inherited together and the recessive alleles were inherited together. Um, we're going to argue later that that's due to the fact that maybe these genes are actually on the same chromosome pair. Um, or they're linked. This is the kind of the data that would support that. Um, but we'll have that discussion later. Let's go ahead and just have a discussion of how to calculate the chi-square here. So first of all, again, we need to figure out the, um, the expected results. And if I calculate expectation that I need to add all of these together, um, and I don't think I did that really quick. So add up the total flies, and I get 306 total. And so once you have 306, you're ready to, um, to uh, set up a null hypothesis first, excuse me. So what if there is no significant difference between the actual data and this prediction is the null you should set up? We need to figure out what we'd get if we expected um, a certain result. And so we add up our flies again. And then since we had a one to one to one to one ratio, that just means one fourth or 25% should have been in each phenotype. Well, 25% um, of the total 306 is 76.5. We should have gotten 76, around 76 or 77 flies of each phenotype. Um, obviously, it seems um, uh, just intuitively that we weren't very close to that, but let's go ahead and calculate according to our formula. So we just need to take every single data point, um, the 145 of the double dominant, we're going to subtract that from 76.5, we're going to square it, and we're going to make it a fraction of the original expectation. We need to do that for every data point, and we need to add them all together. So our next data point, we had 17 minus the 76.5 squared. And we may need to make that a fraction of our original uh, expectation. We're going to add that to our next data point, which is 21. We should have had 76.5. So we want to square that number to make sure it's not negative and make it a fraction of expectation. And then finally, we want to add that to our last data point. We also had 123 that were doubly recessive. Uh, we should have had 76.5. We want to square that and make it a fraction of the original 76.5. Just what we actually got minus what we expected squared over what we expected. And we're just adding all those together. What does that give us? That gives us a sense of how much overall difference there was between what we actually got and what we expected to get. Now, when I calculated that out, I got an overall chi-square of around 176.14. So hopefully you got around the same. That is a gigantic number, but that makes sense. Our data was pretty different from what we expected to get. So let's go ahead and find our appropriate critical value. Um, we're once again going to go ahead and use the um, P rho of 0 0.05. Um, but this time we had four possible different phenotypes. Um, double dominant, dominant recessive, recessive dominant, and double recessive in phenotype. So there were four possible ways the flies could have looked like. Four minus one gives us three degrees of freedom. And therefore, we want to compare it to this critical value, 7.82. 
So since our number, 176.14, was much greater than the critical value, we have to reject our null hypothesis. This data did not match up with what we expected according to the Mendelian model. And so as we're going to discuss in a future video, we need to think about an alternative explanation. And so what scientists did is they said Mendel needs revision. Um, two traits are independent in inheritance and should get those independent results only if the genes are on separate chromosomes or if they behave as if they were on separate chromosomes. Um, and so we're going to talk about the alternative model that they proposed in a future video.